Hello, welcome to the IVF Daddies podcast. My name is Julio Gadja. And I'm Richard Westerby. Welcome. And today we have our special guest, Shadina Blunt. Hello, sorry. We're really good. Thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's such an honor and a privilege to have you here today. So Shadina and I first met uh, last year, in two, well, not last year, it's the year before now. We were at a conference for the Society of Ethics in Egg Donation and Surrogacy, or SEEDS, of which Shadina is a member and I was speaking, I was presenting. And I was just taken by her passion and her energy and just what an amazing human being she was. And then fast forward a few months, this one and I are watching television and? And I am a huge fan of reality TV. And uh, of course he doesn't watch TV and especially not reality TV. And he thought I was just watching guilty pressure shows. And then you come across in the screen and he's like, oh, wait a second, I know her. I know her. Yes. And that's how our worlds collided. Because to me, the value of reality TV is, is having women go through vulnerability instead of, this is something that I went through, I overcame it, and I'm gonna tell you how amazing my life is now. And in the show, you see women struggling and going through it and making decisions that you don't really know if they're the best for you. And that, to me, makes me feel better about myself when I feel like I'm stuck or or I don't know what I'm doing. And 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 is to be honest, I'm from Latin America and there's no talk about IVF or surrogacy. Uh, I just found out with this podcast that there is action. People just don't talk about it out of culture, out of religion, out of shame and guilt and feeling like a failure. And with uh, this show is my only source of visibility is, is momentum. You see these women going through IVF, egg freezing, surrogacy, and that's how we and that's how collided. collided. Yeah. So I was more taken with the fact that you started life out uh, studying medicine, then you became an OBGYN assistant, then you thought, hang on a sec, I can do this. And then you took it to a master's level, and then you took it to another level, and then you decided to start a surrogacy agency. I'm like, tell us a little bit more about the thought process to get you to where you are today. Well, I, honestly, I didn't take a lot of thought process in it. It all kind of just unfolded and happened together. It was like just the gods aligned everything in my life. So where I started off in medicine and then I did my clinical rotation in OBGYN and I'm like, absolutely love this. And then once I actually started working in it, I saw very quickly like, oh my God, there's so many women that are having difficulty getting pregnant, you know, or getting pregnant and having miscarriages and just infertility was like an, at an all time high, even back then. And I was thinking like, I didn't have difficulty getting pregnant. I have my own children very easily. I think I want to go down the route of surrogacy. And I didn't know anything about it. All I knew is I can get pregnant for someone in carry. And um, I started doing my research on really what surrogacy looked like because I had no clue. I just knew I wanted to help in that way. And wow. um, after I started, finished having my own children, I jumped right into it. And after my first journey, I became overwhelmed and inundated with fam like family, friends, strangers, you know, would meet me on the street like, oh, you're pregnant. And I would explain to them like, hey, I'm pregnant as a surrogate. And, you know, they wanted to know more. I had two cousins that say, hey, we've been having this problem, which I knew nothing about. Can you help us and be a carrier? And I'm like, okay, I can't carry for everybody. What's the next thing that I can do to continue to help? And that was to open up an agency, share the knowledge and understanding of what I had learned being a surrogate myself and working on the healthcare side of it. So that's, that's kind of how it all means. unfolded. You know, it's like a, <laughs> God had the plan and he just allowed everything to align to make sure it all worked together. My good and everybody else's good. That is amazing. And I want to give you the flowers that you deserve because to me, you're the ultimate uh, source of information when it comes to a surrogacy example. You have associate in degree in nursing, in, in nursing. You have a master's degree in medical business. You are exposed to yourself in the public eye being a surrogate for worldwide Emmy award-winning uh, candy from the Real Housewives of Atlanta. 
also from Shamia Morton on The Real House of Atlanta. So you went from having a private life mm -hmm. to a public eye that you're the founder of uh, Surrogacy Miracle and Consultant together with Dr. Jackie, whom her labor of love as an OBGYN creating using her platform for promoting fertility, IVF and surrogacy how caught the attention of the vice president of the US, uh, Kamala Harris. You also are the founder of the nonprofit Miracle Family Foundation that helps people of same sex and minority groups that are suffering in silence yes. because opening up about this is really hard. You have done it. And on top of that, you're a mother of three. How do you do it? And, and you're an author. You've also written a book. And that, as I know, is not an easy task. So it's not. it really is. I was like, you read a book. Yeah, it's hard work, man. But um, I, as Julio just said, like that is an impressive resume, which I think whenever I'm talking about you to anybody in this field, you stand out as somebody who is passionate, who knows what they're talking about, who really, really cares. And I think that's one of the things that I would like to touch on, because you have spoken in the past about how you were pregnant for other people. You're a very private person, at least the person I know, you're a very private person. Then all of a sudden you're thrust into the limelight, admittedly of somebody that you knew and you knew that was going to happen. But talk us a little bit about how you felt as a surrogate for somebody in the limelight and the impact that had on you. Because I think that that's something that a lot of people just overlook. They like, oh, you're doing, they're amazing. And you're, you're kind of, relegated to the background a little bit. So I'd like to understand a little bit more about that. So um, my first journey, like you said, a lot of people didn't even know that I carried as a surrogate. Like if you go back to my social media in those days, I posted pictures, but the angles, I never announced being pregnant. It wasn't like, a, it was definitely not public. And when I was asked to um, be candy surrogate, initially it started off just as a console where I was going to help her find the right surrogate. And after we talked and she, you know, we met each other and the more we worked, she's like, look, you're it. You're the perfect person. I need you to do this. And me knowing that I am private, there was some hesitation there because I knew what that was going to look like. But then at the same aspect, I thought this is a great opportunity to really show what a positive experience looks like in surrogacy what women of color being a surrogate looks like because at the time I was not seeing a lot of women at all. I would go to meetings and different events and try to collaborate with other surrogates and there were not a lot of black surrogates. There, there weren't. I mean, if there were, they weren't showing up and speaking out about it. So I thought it was a great opportunity for me to be able to show what that looked like um, and it did exactly what I thought it would do. It opened up the door for so many different women to say, look, I was a surrogate. I loved it. I want to do it again. Or I've been thinking about this for years, but I was afraid to speak up because of um, in our community and culture, it's like taboo. You don't do that. Like you don't help in that way. And it shouldn't be that. And there are a lot of people that believe differently. They just needed a little nudge and a little bit of support of seeing it's okay. It's a positive experience. You know, black women can support each other in that way. And, it, and it's, it's not odd at all. And has that, do you, have you found that that's continued? Has it grown? Has the community of people of color that are surrogates as well as those that want and will need a surrogate that has grown because I mean, from my experience, very, very few people that I've helped have been of color. Literally, I would say a handful. And I, I always find that shocking. And, yeah. to me, and to me, my perspective is uh, from a, a person of a, a Latin background from Venezuela, which uh, includes, you know, the, the black community and people of color and brown Latino uh, minority groups, whomever goes through it, they just don't want to talk about it. They feel... Right failures they feel like a shame and they feel men feel like who does that like who goes through ivf and uh one of the things that i've always asked them you never hear a man saying what if this is not my kid because i'm not carrying it right right so i say that it has increased significantly um we continually see more women step forward on both sides 
you know, to say, hey, I do have problems with infertility and I'm okay with asking for help in that way. Because that was another thing to say, you know, we're strong, you know, we can do, you know, whatever it is that we want to do. We don't need help in that way. And to like to voice to say, I have this problem out loud. Like you can be around friends, like say one and you're around five friends, probably three to four of them have experienced some sort of difficulty, but they don't say it together until someone brings it up and it's like, oh, me too, me too, me too. So I've definitely seen an increase um, and I think it's only going to continue, which is, is absolutely fabulous. It's, uh, it's, I think, as I've said before, like, I think everything you're doing is amazing. And I think one of the things that, that has struck me is each of the pregnancies, the surrogacy pregnancies that you've had has, has had a challenge of sorts. And I think we can touch on each of those pregnancies in a little bit, but what I'd love to know is how has all of that informed how you look after your surrogates? Oh, it's, it's helped significantly because you don't plan for the problems, but you have to, you have to plan for them, right? You have to be aware that these are the possibilities uh, that can happen. And when the disparities of um, maternal health are at an all time high, it kicks it up a notch on the level of care that you want to be able to give your surrogate. The nice thing about me, with me having a medical background, I understood the conversations that were happening around me about my health care. And that's not always the case with um, some of the surrogates as well, as well as the intended parents. So them understanding that they have that level of support helps out a lot. So it's very important to me to make sure that they feel supported they feel heard. Um, they have families themselves. And at the end of the day, we want to make sure that these new families are created, but the ones that are already built are sustained and they're healthy. Also, something that I want to touch base in the same uh, topic that we're talking about, because from my experience as a immigrant from Latin America and as a gay man, I sometimes I feel like I have to work twice as hard for half the the well, earnings. And sometimes I feel like I don't have the privilege and the luxury to complain mortality rates on uh, women of color. Uh, and it says 70% high in America. Can you um, help us to understand what is Black maternal health awareness and how can we help? Yeah, so that's that is being more aware of the needs that uh, black women need um, concerning their care. So when they're going to the doctor and they're speaking about uh, maybe something that they may be feeling a pain or something they have some concern about that they are feeling heard and they feel like they're being represented and taken care of. Um, even something as simple as I have a discomfort in my side. You may or may not be pregnant, but taking that as something serious until it's not serious um, is what we need to see happen. There shouldn't be the numbers that there are of deaths behind um, deliveries of babies and in, in, in women's health care at all, at all. It's, it's kind of shocking, actually, when you look at the numbers and you look at there is no reason for it. Realistically, yeah. mm -hmm. and I mean, if it is going to be, there shouldn't be that big of a curve from other races. That's the concern. We could see, you know, if it was across the board, all races the same thing, then we'd be say, okay, there's a problem with healthcare in general. But when it's steered one way or the other based off of race, that means that there are is biases that are in place that we need to move out of the way for um, women's rights and women's health overall. Yeah. So you've been a surrogate, you've been a mother of your kids, and you've carried kids for other people. And you have had amazing pregnancies and you have had challenging pregnancies. When you as an agency uh, have your surrogates and their obstacles like this, how, what is the best advice and the boundaries in between the intended parents and the surrogate? Um, honestly, we see that intended parents are very supportive of their surrogates and making sure like, like that's one of their ultimate goals when you ask them about like their biggest fear is that something were to happen to their surrogate during the journey. So we don't necessarily find it where there are parents that are like put their needs and their wants before a surrogate's health, which is, which is good is what we want to see. 
Um, but where we see it at, again, is in healthcare. And so we go to bat and we go to war for our surrogates and what they need. And a lot of times the parent needs us to do that, to make sure that it's being relayed that the surrogate's health is, you know, what's most important in the process of the journey. And I think having that confidence that your agency is with the surrogate sitting there by her side saying, hang on a sec, no, 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 you need to check this, Mr. or Mrs. Doctor, you need to do this and what's going on and how is it? Because of course you do this day in, day out. And like that, I remember when I was being the intended parent, that, that mm -hmm. for me, that level of confidence was, was something I didn't have and I wish I had had. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's an amazing thing that you do. Um, one of the things that as an intended parent, obviously it was incredibly expensive to go through. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the Surrogacy Miracles Foundation that you started and why you started it and how can people help if anybody feels like donating and also are there grants how to explain a little bit more, bit more about that yes so i started the foundation i had already had the agency open about a year and of course we meet a number of intended parents that come and want to get information of course the big topic is the cost and i was finding where there were more parents than not that needed to use surrogacy to grow their family that just could not afford it at all and it's heartbreaking like nobody plans to use surrogacy you know like it's like it's not like as you're growing up, you say, you know what, I'm going to put all my money to the side because I'm going to need a surrogate one day. Unless, you know, you're a same-sex couple and say, you know, we know we're going to need this at some point. But most families, they don't plan on that. It's not like buying a house or saving for a boat or so have you. So we created the foundation to offer grants um, between 10K all the way up to 30K. It doesn't cover the full cost of what a journey looks like, but sometimes that can be life changing for people to get some of those things taken care of. So whether it's a transfer, whether it's help with the insurance part, um, medications, legal, um, there's there's multiple different areas in the surrogacy journey that these grants can help. So of course we have to have funds in order to be able to offset that. I know as an agency from that standpoint, I do a lot of pro bono cases. I can't do it all by myself. Um, and I'd like to be able to at least offer five grants a year to five different families. So that's where we have a goal this year in the first quarter, hopefully to um, grow the foundation of 100K. So that way in the second and third quarter, we can divide that up to families that are in need. Um, again, it is also specifically for minorities and same-sex couples. I was finding where grants that were out there, like I, we would do research for grants to be able to tell the families that came to us what was out there. And it's like, I don't see a lot specifically, or if they have grants, it doesn't say that it's specifically for one party or the other. But when you look at the recipients that were, were winning these grants, none of them met that criteria. So I felt like we needed something that was specific for those areas um, as far as minorities and uh, things like couples, single parent, like all of those, they need to be included and have somewhere they can go to be able to get help. That's why I did it. <laughs> I think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful because family is everything. Nobody wants to die alone. Yeah. I know you are intending to work until 120. Yes. Um, <laughs> Yes, I will die doing this. You guys will have to come and probably scoop my body out of my office <laughs> to bury me. Well, I'm glad yeah. I can help and, and be supportive that way. Yeah. And where can people find information? Where can people find the uh, information about the foundation? Where can they make donations? Yeah, so if you go to surrogacymiraclesandconsulting.org slash foundation, it'll take you to directly to the foundation page. There is a link there where you can click donate and you can donate or you can send us an email. And, you know, if you have specific area that you would like your funds to go to, we can make sure that happens. So we would. And I think we can put a link in, in we'll the bottom of our yeah. podcast as well so that people yeah. should. We will put it everywhere. The world will know. It. I and uh, something because the reason uh, I'm doing this f to educate myself because I'm dating someone that has kids through IVF and surrogacy, and for me it's a brand new ocean. And sometimes his kids are 11; they're at an age that we have conversations that made me go like, 
oh my god let me just look over there run and find information and see like how to approach this conversation so for me it's just basically i'm um, educating myself and i'm just doing it in a public uh platform uh and that has brought me a lot of questions from a lot of people that don't want to express their uh, losses or miscarriages how can what is the best way for people that want to be surrogates to contact or be uh come into consideration for it yes um we need a lot of surrogates so you know, there's never enough surrogates um there's never going to be a drought unfortunately of parents that need support so the more women that we get to sign up to help families the better so you can go to our website surrogacy miracles and consulting.org and there is uh, intake paperwork that you can start you can see the requirements uh, to be a surrogate and you want to call and get more information and do your research to really understand what you're signing up for because it is a process and a journey. It's not just sign up, get pregnant, I'm carrying somebody's baby. There's a lot of intel that you want to consider when you're deciding, uh, but we're here to support you through it. Yeah, because it's funny, because we have done the first episode, which was um, the audiobook version of his book, which it was basically um, putting together information as he was, as he was going. And one of the most um, watched uh, episodes has been surrogacy in particular, surrogacy agencies, and a lot of questions on it. So we're going to make sure that uh, your information is going to be valuable for a lot of people. Uh, yeah, a, a lot of families are like, what's the point of using an agency? You know, there's enough information out there that you don't need one. But there are so many things that you can't plan for that you, you need that agency support, you know, say, God forbid, something does happen in the journey. Uh, like, I'll use myself for an example, even though I was the agency, I guess, where I developed breast cancer in the middle of one of my surrogacy journeys, right? And so, of course, as a parent, you're thinking about the surrogate, but then you're also thinking about the baby. And it's hard to take yourself out of parent mode and just be in, I need to support her. So you need help in that middle part. You need that middle person to be able to say, okay, we're going to step in and try to to navigate what's going to work best for both parties. Um, so it's like taking the emotion out of the process so that you can focus on what needs to be done and let those people that are in that emotional state run with what they need to do. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And, you know, I think we've all seen the, the the breast cancer story and i think you're an amazing human being for being so open and honest about it and again not only raising awareness about surrogacy but also raising awareness about breast cancer um and so this is going to touch on two things that i think are very uh pertinent to you specifically one is about confidentiality and from a surrogate's perspective because i one of the questions i always get from some of the, the people that I know who are also very well known is, how do I know if my surrogate is not going to talk to everybody, for example? Right. And then two, with regards to the breast cancer itself, I know that there were issues around the healthcare and being in network, out of network and being covered and all those different things. So maybe you can explain a little bit about how that works as well, because I think that's something that intended parents don't understand. Um, so could you touch on those two? Yeah, um, as far as like the insurance for the surrogacy journey, when you have an issue that's outside of there. Yeah. Well, um, again, and that's something that an agency would help you navigate, um, because if you have a surrogate, of course, that has her own insurance, then that may or may not cover all of that. Versus if you just have a surrogacy policy that only covers that, then that may be a separate issue. So um, you really want an agency that can kind of navigate navigate that part for you, to be honest with you. Um, but a lot of it gets mixed together depending on where you are in the journey, how far you are, and again, what, what policy you have. Okay. And then the confidentiality bit as well. So... <sighs> There is a level of confidentiality that you have, but at the same time, you're carrying someone else's baby. And so they want full intel on what's happening with you, especially if it's something that surrounds the baby, you know, that can involve the baby, you know, something like 
having breast cancer. You can't just separate the two, right? So it's kind of hard to say, I'm only going to talk to you about baby stuff and leave all that other stuff out. And if you have a surrogate like that, then you want to make sure that that relationship makes sense before you even get started. And a lot of times we don't see where it, it, it comes to a point where you're have that like that strict divided line. Um, some of it kind of crosses over into each other, honestly, honestly. So you really become part of the family. You do, you do during that time period. Now, after baby's born, then that dynamic may change. But when you guys are in the meat and the potatoes of a pregnancy and things arise, then you guys have to really be on the same page and collaborating and making decisions that work for both people. I have to say, as much as I was worried about myself and what might happen, I also was worried about baby. Like we've come so far to get to this point I would hate for something now to happen to baby. But they were like, oh, my God, we need to make sure she's okay." And so the doctors was like, "Okay, you're worried about them. They're worried about you. Like it just worked well. Thank God. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That I mean, because, uh, of course, I mean, when you're not in the middle of it, in my perspective, you could see that. Oh, my God, I like I'm going to lose my baby. But right. when but I can see that you want you long for a family so much that when you have someone in the process, it's inevitable to have that person become your family. You have your your story with you send a letter uh, with your kids to the egg donor and the surrogate every year. I send them a picture of the family of what we're doing. And it, it maintains that that bond because, you know, I wouldn't have my children without either of those two amazing women, right? And I think mm-hmm. that that every day, I'll cry, every day that just, I, I sometimes just go, oh my gosh, without them, I wouldn't be here. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, is, is such a beautiful thing that you do. But I, this also then brings me, and it's a topic of the day that a lot of people are talking about. Um, so a few weeks ago, the Pope was talking about surrogacy and exploitation of women mm-hmm. and, Running an agency, having been a surrogate, you're a woman. What are your thoughts on that? I I just don't see it that way. You know, I it's not. It's, you know, a lot of these women come with open arms and they see themselves as a vessel. And a lot of times it's just like, whatever the family needs, I'm here to support that. So, and they're still making decisions about themselves and families are being very respectful. It's, you know, we get calls all the time. Like, have you seen Handmaid's Tales? And have you seen the surrogate? I'm like, that is nothing what is happening here. These women are being fully taken care of. They're making decisions about what their compensation looks like. We don't tell them, it's like, oh, it's only worth this much. We can't put a dollar amount on that. So they are saying what they need to feel fully supported and comfortable with moving forward. And we're making sure that they have those things. So they're not being exploited at all. I didn't feel like I was being exploited at all on any level, publicly, or having to share my story publicly. I made it very clear that I will not have cameras in the labor and delivery room and my everything everywhere, you know, so you still have control, you know, so I mean, we've heard stories, you know, where surrogates didn't get paid and they didn't, you know, they, you know, they were left with having to make decisions, um, but those are far and few between. And I bet they were not working with a reputable surrogacy agency. The world loves you. The world has welcomed you with open arms. There's no one single negative comment on the entire internet about uh your experience and that that says a lot because going through uh something that is really challenging and still wanting to to go hard for other people uh that cannot have the ability to have a family is it just it's amazing to me it's just very inspiring and i would like to ask you is there anything that you want to say that it hasn't been asked, something that you want to touch on? Um, I just think, you know, these are great platforms to share information. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't say that there's not 
one negative comment, but those that are negative is because of lack of education and understanding what surrogacy really is. And so the more that we have platforms like this to share information, share what surrogacy really looks like, it only helps our community and our industry. And so I would say thank you to you guys for being so open and honest and allowing me to share my story and what surrogacy looks like. Um, and I, I hope people will continue to learn, continue to support, and continue to help with um, infertility advocacy, insurance advocacy, surrogacy advocacy, just continue to build up this industry um, so that way it can grow and that more families can be created. Wow, Shadina, you are a superstar. I want to say keep breaking those barriers, keep being the inspirational human being that you are. We love you. I think you're one of the most amazing people I know. Um, thank you so much for your time. I know today is it's uh, you're many miles away, but if I could give you a cyber hug, I would. Um, and and we hope to see you very soon. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I, and I want to say that I hope you have someone in your team to speak Spanish because we're also having the podcast in Spanish, and we're getting a lot of questions especially because we work with uh, Europe and Latin America and Spain through IVF and surrogacy in the US. So I hope you're ready. Oh, that's awesome. We do, we are ready. We are ready to support everyone. Brilliant, thank you so much. You're very, you're, you're amazing. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.